try to help you visualize tonight what a more sustainable economy would look like, what a more sharing economy would look like. You also hear the, the term a lot, the new economy. So you know, there's a lot happening. There's going to be a lot of sort of visual image so, images so that we can just sort of visualize what this future is going to look like. Um, so anyways, let me, uh, let me just make a quick adjustment. So as far as, um, I guess, well, basically, when we're changing the world, we kind of have to start with where we are. And where we are is that society has kind of, as we've grown up, as we've grown up has sort of taught us to have these plans and goals in life. And, and those plans are things like, well, first of all, we have to make a livelihood. And what that means is we're going to get a job, and that job is going to give us money, preferably lots of it. And then we're going to take that to the store or to the landlord or you know wherever it is we, we get our stuff and then get the things we need. That's kind of this is actually a dictionary definition I found on Google dictionary of livelihood anyways. So go to work get money buy the stuff we need. Um, I don't know if I would say that's a, a lively livelihood but anyways. And so and then over time we accumulate a lot of money. We get a car, we get a house, we fill the house with everything we'll ever need at any given moment you know, like a vacuum cleaner. And basically the goal is to live in a vacuum. And if we could do that, then we'll be fine. And this is sort of like the plan that we've all had. And I, when I was a kid, I really liked this plan. It made total sense to me because I read Sunset Magazine all the time. And, um, and I was going to have a really big garden and a beautiful house. It, you know, sounded great. But unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you want to look at it, um, Lately, something has begun to eat away at our ability to carry out this plan and our ability to accumulate assets as our source of future security. And basically what we have now is the situation. <laughs> and the situation has kind of arisen from the fact that, well, we've, we've used our planetary resources faster than they can be replenished. Oops. And... We've basically uh, built our entire economic system on, on this idea of perpetual growth. And uh, so then we're kind of left here sort of hanging. We don't really have that, that same source of security. You know, what is our, what is our future going to look like? And I actually think that we are going to be creative and innovative and audacious enough to, to let go of that original plan and build a whole new economy based on something even groovier, which is sharing and collaboration. And so... What does that look like? Uh, I like to break it down into four levels, just so we can start to picture what it is going to look like in our lives. And so at the first level of sharing, we start to do things, we start to share and collaborate in ways that are relatively easy. They're kind of casual, spontaneous, maybe on a one-time basis, you know, you borrow a shovel from your neighbor, you might share a ride, you know, give, you know, carpool every now and then, um, do favors for people, casually swap and barter stuff. And, I think that what we need to do is just really grow. I mean, we really need to do this so much more than we currently do it. Like, if, if your vacuum cleaner breaks, I think a lot of our, our tendency is just to go buy another one. But really, we're surrounded in our communities by people who have vacuum cleaners. We just don't have a culture where we go and ask for one. And um, I think if we just start to do this a whole lot more, it's going to begin to change our culture into one where, where we just help provide for each other more. So that's the first level. That's the easy stuff. Um, Going a little bit deeper, at the second level, we start to make agreements with each other, and we start to make real solid plans for sharing. So not just like casually borrowing the vacuum cleaner. It's like co-owning it with your neighbor or making an agreement to always borrow it. Because when you have an agreement, it's something that you can rely on. And then you can just start to rely on sharing as a way to meet your needs. So maybe sharing ownership of a car or regularly borrowing your neighbor's car, uh, doing regular childcare exchanges, sharing an office. Um, yeah, and then at the third level, sharing starts to become more of an institution in our society because we're forming organizations to share. So rather than just sharing ownership of a car with a neighbor, we might form a whole car sharing club. Let's say you live in an apartment building. Maybe 10 neighbors form a group to share ownership of three cars. And you know, when one neighbor leaves, uh, that's fine. The car sharing arrangement is still going to be there. So organizations endure even when individuals come and go from them. Um, and then at the fourth level, we take a city like, well, 
let's say Santa Barbara, actually. I don't know how that got in there. Um, so at the fourth level, we just start to build sharing into the whole infrastructure of our city. So citywide car sharing programs, citywide bike sharing programs, um, you know, enterprise incubators like shared commercial kitchens where small scale entrepreneurs can go and you know, use them on a temporary basis. You know, when these kind of get built into our, our whole community, sharing really becomes something we can rely on. And then, you know, as for that original plan of like the only way that we're gonna survive in this world is, is to accumulate a lot of stuff and money. Well, I actually, okay, it's, it's really hard to let go of this. It's really hard to not panic when I think, I don't have a retirement account yet. Or, yeah, I don't, you know, it's hard not to panic. But really, if I think about it, I don't need that if I can build a world based on this. So that's why I've pretty much dedicated my life to building a world based on this, a world where we all kind of casually share with each other, where we make agreements to share with each other, where we form organizations and build it into the infrastructure of our city. Because if we have that, then I sort of feel like we'll all be provided for, I'll be provided for. So I'm gonna just give some images of just what, it could, what sharing could look like in our communities. Um, this is kind of like Google Earth. This is looking down at, <laughs> looking down at our neighborhoods. This is more or less what it looks like. Um, so just to kind of describe a little bit of, about what's going on here. Um, so everybody kind of lives in these um, little boxes. There's a green one, there's a pink one, there's a blue one, and a yellow one. <laughs> yeah, and they're all made out of ticky-tacky. They all look the same. <laughs> and then, um, you know, they're all kind of divided off by fences. And then so, so here are these families. Like, a lot of these families have kids. You know, you see the swing sets, the tetherball. They might not actually know each other or play together, because just in this day and age, a lot of times we don't know our neighbors. Um, and... There's about 2.3 cars per household, as per the national average, which is why that person up in the corner is still looking for parking. There's a, you know, every household has its own grill. Um, the, you know, there's some fruit trees here. You know, there's a plum tree up there in that corner. It's kind of cut off, but um, I used to have this problem. We had a plum tree, which like for about one week would give us about 500 plums, and I would try to eat them all myself. It's a really bad idea. Um, so. I mean, yeah, so this is kind of like the predicament. Oh, and another thing what you can't see is the houses are kind of, and the closets and the garages are so full of stuff. Just sort of, you know, the drill that you bought that you used once, the saw that you bought that you never figured out how to use, so you never used it and you put it in the closet. You know, that kind of stuff. It's, they're so full that they had to get these two extra sheds. So there's one up in the corner there to store their extra stuff. And if you look at Google Earth, you see, like, there's a lot of sheds. I, look, I spend a lot of time looking at Google Earth and, yeah, you know, some some people, you know, you look down at Google Earth and like Tucson, Arizona, it's like everybody has a pool. Um, you know, there's there's just not a lot of sharing going on, and and sort of like the the thing that I always come back to and that I think about is like, well, we're all living in a vacuum, and a vacuum is living in every house, and um, you know, this to me is just like the symbol of, of sharing. It's like you just you use the vacuum cleaner like only 0.001 percent of the time, unless you have pets, maybe a little bit more, but. Um, yeah, you just don't, everybody doesn't have to have one. But anyway, so let's see what could happen in this neighborhood. Well, you kind of need to start to break the ice. When you have it, when you've lived by your neighbors for five years and you never met them, it's kind of awkward to start meeting them. But you know, there's, there's little things you can do to start breaking the ice. Well, for one, give the neighbors some of those plums, please. And you know, share some fruit. So, you know, so these neighbors have a little bit of fruit sharing going on. It turns out they, they like each other, hey. well. This is a little bit radical, but it could happen. Either sort of figuratively or literally, people start to take down their fences, all right? So they're sharing their yards. Every, now they have this huge yard. The kids now know each other and they play together. They got rid of one of those redundant swing sets. And um, they got down to two grills, a gas and a charcoal grill. And, and now they're sharing meals, so they have a space in their yard where they might all gather, uh, you know, maybe once or twice a week and kind of share some of the cooking responsibilities. And they're sharing garden space. They have a nice herb garden and vegetable garden. And, and they're sharing chickens. You know, the chicken sharing thing, it's weird. Like, ever since I wrote this book on sharing, and I go around talking about sharing, 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 it's like the number one thing that people bring up is like, I think I want to share some chickens. <laughs> or I've been thinking about sharing chickens, or I share chicken, 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 chicken. Anyways. <laughs> 
But the thing about that, which, you know, it occurred to me is, you know, having chickens is hard. It's a lot of work. You have to build a coop. You have to take care of them. And then they give you these eggs. You know, if you're going to have two chickens and get, I don't know, how many, that might be a dozen eggs per week, if, you know. If you're going to have two chickens and put all that work in, you might as well have, like, ten chickens and share them with your neighbors share the responsibility and get four dozen eggs per week and then divide them up among the households. And it's kind of a symbol for everything that we're trying to do to make our lives more sustainable or make our communities more sustainable is that a lot of what we need to do is a lot of work, like putting solar in our houses, you know, putting gray water systems, rainwater catchment systems, um, doing water purification, you know, doing... Um, growing food, even, even composting, these things are, you know, they take some work, they take up space, they take some skill. It makes sense, you know, we just can't do all of them alone because we're never all going to be able to do that in our own little boxes on a hillside made out of ticky tacky. So, yeah, so we just kind of, you know, sharing is a way not only to reduce what we consume, but also to replace it with, with practices that are more sustainable. So, so here's what else these neighbors have done. They've They've sort of looked at all their stuff. They've been able to get rid of a lot of their redundant junk or their useless junk by creating these two sharing sheds. So on the bottom, you have the shared tool shed that everybody has access to. And if you think about it in our neighborhoods, there's a lot of, there's a lot of sheds, there's garages, there might be like separate laundry rooms or whatever, things that people could have separate access to that you could turn into a sharing uh, hub or a sh you know, sharing shed. So they've done that, and then they also have just the shared stuff shed where they put all the other things they might want to share, like the vacuum cleaner, the, um, you know, maybe a bread maker, some recreational equipment, and um, yeah, what else are they doing? Yes, there's their vacuum cleaner, the one vacuum cleaner. And then just um, taking some of the stress out of life and reducing our cost by, by sharing tasks. So here people are painting the house. Um, but, you know, a lot of the other things that we want to do to live more sustainably, like we all think, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to weatherize my house. I need to put in more insulation, seal the cracks, you know. But it's a lot of work. It's way more fun to do that in groups. And I know a lot of people have formed these home repair groups or sort of like, a, what do they call them, Ener energy raising co-ops. Kind of, It's like the old barn raising, but people going around and doing like energy retrofits to each other's homes. So that's... That's what these folks are doing. And then, you know, also helping each other out with child care. They might have, like, a point system to keep track of who's done the child care. Um, you know, elder care is another thing that can happen in the context of neighborhoods. There's a famous neighborhood in Boston where uh, a lot of people are just aging in their neighborhood by purchasing services collectively, you know, shared in-home care services and everything. And, uh, and then the sum total is, um, you're up next, Jenny. The sum total is that you just have a really cool community, and you're probably looking at this and going, that's utopia, that's not going to happen. But what I would, would like to say is that this is pretty much my life, <laughs> or it was, for six years I lived in what we called casual co-housing, and if you had looked at it on, uh, on the surface, it was just a normal neighborhood. I lived in a duplex, there was a duplex across the street. We all just shared a lot. We did, well, we shared a hot tub, I forgot to mention that. We shared a vacuum cleaner, just haul it back and forth across the street every now and then. And um, we had a separate laundry room that we could all use. We, I gardened across the street. We shared meals two times a week. Pretty much anybody could do this. We didn't take down fences because there, you know, there weren't any. But um, Oh, and we would lend each other cars. One thing I forgot to mention is these neighbors, they got rid of some of their extra cars. Now they're sharing a pickup truck up there and uh, an electric vehicle for those around town trips. And uh, yeah, where I used to live, my housemate shared a pickup truck with five other households. It was just, this stuff can really happen. It doesn't necessarily have to look like that, but um, it makes life kind of fun and interesting. But yeah, so Jenny's going to sort of like broaden it a little bit. It's not just sort of about our households, but you know, what do our businesses look like and enterprise? Localization is another, is a very related topic to sharing. And I don't know how many people have heard of Business Alliance for Local Living Economies. It's one of several organizations that are all about promoting locally owned business because that's another way to share resources and keep more resources local. And a lot of you probably have given a lot of thought to this already, but there are so many benefits to keeping our resources locally owned and locally controlled. Just for one thing, the more things we do locally, the less long distance travel there is, which is obviously much better for the environment. It conserves resources. It keeps our the greenhouse gases on the, you know lower. Um, also, um, when 
assets are owned and controlled locally, the people that are controlling them are likely to be a lot more concerned with the effects of their actions on the local community because they live there in the community too. So if you have a locally owned business, you're probably going to be a lot more careful about what kind of things you emit from your, you know, the pipes that come out the back of the door and things like that. So, and how you treat your workers because your workers are your neighbors. So there's the accountability. There's also the fact that when a locally owned business is going to be a lot more unique. You know, there's a lot of towns all over the country that are really trying to be special and unique. Like you, you might have heard of this movement called Keep Austin Weird. So there's a lot of places that are doing things like that, and they want to be special. They don't want to be any place USA where, you know, everyone has the Target, the Walmart, the Old Navy, whatever. You know, they want stuff in their place that's special to what they're all about. And then that really promotes people wanting to come and visit because it's special. Also, when you spend money at a locally owned business, studies have shown that 45 cents of money spent at locally owned businesses goes right back into the economy and recirculates. So at least 45 cents is going to be spent at other local businesses, whereas if you spend your money at a chain store, only 15 cents stays in the economy. So I just wanted to give a couple of examples of, um, of some businesses that I've worked with or that we know about that are just really wonderful examples of businesses that are trying to incorporate a lot of these ideas into the way they operate. So one is Awaken Cafe, that's in Oakland. And, and the examples I'm using, I'm using, I could give so many examples of wonderful businesses, but I'm purposely using examples of businesses that have done some very creative things from a legal perspective, and they've overcome some of the legal barriers to having this kind of economy. So Awaken Cafe, um, it, uh, when they, so they wanted to open in downtown Oakland. There wasn't a lot going on in downtown Oakland when they were first talking about opening. And so what they, and they needed to raise money to open. So what they did is they, they started to create a lot of buzz around the community. They would go to events and they had a Facebook page and they started talking about, hey, we want to open up this cafe. It's going to be a green cafe. It's going to have art and music. So they, um, they told people, if you want to see this happen, you can buy what we're going to call a cafe creator card. So you would pay $1,000 for this card or sorry, you would pay $800 for the card, but the card was worth $1,000 in purchases at the cafe once it opened. So this was a way that they were able to raise enough money to open. They avoided some of the legal constraints on raising money for a new business. And it also just created these incredibly loyal fans that were so excited about the cafe when it finally opened. And they've been really successful. Now they're expanding into a larger space a block away. This is another really neat example. Um, so Market Creek Plaza, it's in the San Diego area. And um, it, what happened was there's a nonprofit in this low-income community in this, in this area. And they wanted to create an economic development project. And so you, you know, a lot of nonprofit community development corporations will go ahead and you know, build some kind of real estate project with some you know, commercial space and housing. But they said, we want to do this differently. We actually want the community residents to own a piece of this project. We want this to be a locally owned project. So they actually sold, um, I think it was $10 shares to the local community in this project. And again, that's very challenging from a securities law perspective, but they figured out how to do it and they did it. So now this, this has been a pretty successful project from what I understand, and I think the reason it hasn't gone the way of a lot of shopping malls is that you know, it's still doing well because people own it and they get profits from owning it. So it's something that people really care about and take good care of. And this is another example of a community-owned store. And there's quite a few of these all over the country, but this was the first one. Um, a lot of da uh, downtowns, traditional downtowns, have been losing their small locally-owned businesses because Walmart's set up, you know, not too far away. And, the, and oftentimes the whole downtown will become very depressed and it, they'll put the local businesses out of business. 
But this town, when that happened, they said, we, don't, we want our local store. We don't want to have to drive down the road and go to Walmart. So they did a community stock offering. Again, very challenging from a legal perspective, but they did do it. They made it work. And now that store is owned by the community. And so this really keeps resources local. The store is controlled by the local community. It, gen it puts a lot more wealth back into the community than if it was owned by some kind of outside owner. And this is another example of a really great business. Um, Equal Exchange sells fair trade coffee and chocolate, and they only source from co-ops in the countries that produce those products. And then Equal Exchange itself is also a worker co-op, so everyone who works for Equal Exchange owns a piece of the company, has control over the company, and one really interesting thing that they did, they needed to raise a lot of money. It's a capital intensive business, so they needed to get outside investors. So when they, they went out, and they didn't raise money from the community in the way these others did. They actually did raise money from mostly wealthy investors and in private uh, securities offerings. But what they did is when they said, you know, you can buy a piece of our company, and we're going to do our best to give you a 5% annual return every year on your investment. It's not guaranteed, but we think we can do that. Um, and however, you can never sell your share at a profit. If we ever are sold or if we shut down, any excess money after we pay back just your initial investment that you put in is going to be donated to a nonprofit dedicated to fair trade. So it completely takes out all the pressure that exists in a lot of companies. Like the, you might have heard the story of Ben and Jerry's, where there was all this pressure to sell Ben and Jerry's to a big multinational corporation. But that'll never happen with equal exchange because it's written right into their bounding documents that no one can get rich if it sells or 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 shuts down. So was, I think that was. All I was going to be talking about, isn't that right? <laughs> oh yes. Um, so we have so um, Business Alliance for Local Living Economies. Um, they're a really great organization that I would highly recommend. I don't know if there's a, is there a local network? Does anyone know a local Bali network? So I would highly recommend you know looking into starting a local Bali network, maybe combining it with something that's already going on. They have a lot of really great resources. They have calculators and you know ways to figure out you know what what's leaking out of your community and maybe how to keep it keep it local, keep keep all those resources in your community, how to do a buy local week to educate the community about the importance of buying local. And one thing they have is like uh, you can find out an estimate of how much money is sitting right here in your community that's, that is available to be invested. Because, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of, you, we think, you know, a lot of us don't have a lot of money to invest. <laughs> we may have a retirement account, we may have a few hundred dollars in a bank account. Especially now, you know, there isn't a lot, for, a lot of us are kind of struggling just to, you know, eat from what we're earning. However, if you look at the total assets available to be invested in Santa Barbara County, and I, I figured this out by looking at a, a calculator that Bali has, it's uh, about $46 billion. And so most of that money is invested in mutual funds, um, sitting in bank accounts, you know, things like that. So most of that money is not helping your local community at all. It's going somewhere else. It's going to Wall Street. It's going to China and being burnt up in a smokestack somewhere. So just think about, you know, if you even took a small percentage of that money and figured out a way to invest it locally, how much that could do. So even given, you know, the difficult economic times, you know, sometimes we feel really disempowered because things are kind of hard right now. But even with that, there's a huge amount of assets that are kind of, I, I don't want to say they're being wasted, but they could go to much better use if they were helping your local economy. OK, so now we're going to get into some of the legal stuff. Um, let's see. All right, so I am a sharing lawyer. People are always like, what the heck is that? Well, so a lot of what I do, and, and also what Jenny does, even though she may not always go around sounding like a hippie sharing lawyer, um, is, um, well, for one thing, we write a lot of agreements. Uh, 
I write a lot of agreements for people to share ownership of housing, share ownership of cars. Uh, a large part of where lawyers come in is when people want to form entities. Um, and that's sort of like the third level of sharing that I was talking about, is we begin to form organizations in our communities that are going to enable local economies or enable us to share. So, you know, here's the example where, you know, a group of people, maybe 10 people in an apartment building, decide to share three cars. You know, they're going to have to figure out, should we form a limited liability company or a non-profit mutual benefit company, you know, a corporation? You know, there's all these things to, to think about. Uh, sharing lawyers also try to figure out how people are going to share the risk because inevitably some th you know things do go wrong uh, and you want to just sort of figure out you know who who's responsible for what and then definitely the tax stuff is very interesting and I think you know it's, it's been much easier to figure out when a taxable tra transaction takes place when you're exchanging with money money is very easy to quantify um, it's very neat and clean but in a more sharing economy and a more sustainable economy, we think that value is going to be moving around in so many different forms and 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 forums. Fora. Um, anyway, so you know, giving, sharing, bartering, um, co-ownership. You know, va you know, value is moving around. It's hard to figure out when has a taxable transaction taken place, uh, and and what is it worth. And then. There are all of these legal barriers, all of these legal regulations, legal, well, legal hoops that people have to jump through. And what we've started to realize, and this is kind of like one of the main motivations for starting the Sustainable Economies Law Center, is that some of these are just way too high for a lot of the projects and clients that we work with. Uh, and what we noticed is that some people don't have any problem getting through these hoops. Um, but it, it just takes a lot of resources that a lot of our clients just don't have. And, what I realized, you know, when I started to really think deeply about creating a more sh sharing economy and, and the legal aspect, I realized that a lot of the laws and regulations that we have are about regulating relationships. And those are re relationships like employer-employee, consumer-producer, um, investor and business, landlord-tenant. And, and the laws over the past century have developed with the idea that these relationships are going to be very unequal and that there's potential for, for exploitation. And, and that's totally true. Um, and so I'm really glad we have these laws. But what, what the sharing economy is, is basically a complete reorganization of all of these relationships uh, into ones that are, that are not so exploitative or unequal, but are very collaborative in nature. So a lot of times, you know, in a worker co-op, the employer is the employee. In a housing co-op, the landlord is the tenant. Um, in a grocery co-op, or, or more or less, the consumer is the producer. So, uh, so the sharing economy is really not, it doesn't fit well into the existing legal categories we have. And so, and a lot of times when I try to explain, you know, what, what are these new relationships in a sharing economy, I kind of break it down into consumption and production. And the way that we're going to consume in a more sustainable economy is that rather than needing to buy and own everything that we need, we are going to be able to access it in other ways. We might co-own it or borrow it or own shares of it. And the entities or the groups of the people that own it or manage it are going to be maybe a cooperative or uh, just simply other people or community, groups of friends. And so on the production side, you know, a lot of our efforts right now um, oftentimes it goes into just one job, you know, the nine to five job, the eight to six job, the seven to seven job, whatever it is. Um, and I just think like in a more sustainable economy and, and really like the unemployment rate is basically forcing this to come about, our efforts are going to be put into a much broader range of activities. Uh, for one, we're going to be putting uh, a lot more time and energy into creating the communities that sustain us and that provide for us. We're also just going to, it's going to open up a whole new world of micro enterprise. Uh, I mean, I think, well, first of all, we'll have more time to put, put into projects, you know, like backyard gardening. I think a lot of our sustenance is going to come directly from the activities that we're engaging in. But we are also, you know, going to be able to just open up this world of micro enterprise because we're creating platforms for micro entrepreneurs to thrive. Um, wait, where the heck did that? Oh, yeah. You know, and some of those platforms are things, you know, like the shared commercial kitchen that allows small food entrepreneurs to get off the ground, um, you know, cooperatives that help people aggregate products and market them, uh, time banks, time banks 
are great. Uh, it allows people to provide services for each other in exchange for points that then they can go redeem for other services. So these, all of these activities are going to sustain us, but not always with money, sometimes with money, just not always. Um, and if you, and you, know, if, you, if you think about it, we don't really need money because money is just like a piece of paper that enables us to get the things that we do need. And if we've created an economy where we can get those things via other means, then that's great. Um, so, and then the other way that we participate in production is through capital. And right now, as Jenny mentioned, a lot of the businesses in our communities like Target and Walmart, they're typically owned by people outside the community. So when we work for those businesses or, or when we put, um, or when we buy from them, any excess uh, wealth that we're creating leaves the community. So preferably, if our communities owned all of the businesses that are here locally, um, that money wouldn't be going elsewhere. And then, um, you know, the other problem is, of course, you know, that money goes elsewhere, and then who knows what happens with it? It's often things that are not in our our interests. So, so as for these legal hoops, you know, before we can really, you know, launch all the micro enterprise I was just talking about, we do need to sort of look at what are the the barriers that are being presented. And I think um, the sort of framework in which I think about is that there's this whole realm of economic activity that takes place in our personal lives, in our homes. You know, like we make soup for our families. Um, you know, that's not a very regulated realm of activity. We, we all just do it. You know, we don't think about the legal aspect. Um, and then there's the things that happen at the commercial level. Um, and then there's just everything in between, and I think that everything in between is going to be the new economy. So here are some sort of visual examples. Like I said, we make soup at home. It's very different from actually having an entire soup restaurant. But now, you know, there's this whole movement. A lot of times people call it the underground food movement. of just like this movement of people providing food for each other in new settings. And there's a, like underground restaurants where people cook and they have people over. And uh, sometimes they charge, sometimes not. Sometimes they just ask for donations, you know. But what is that? Is that a restaurant? It's kind of right in this legal gray area where I've made it green. Um, another example is, you know, our cars, our transportation. Most people have cars, no big deal, not very complicated. It's very different from having a car rental company. You know, there's regulations on car rental companies. You need to have certain insurance, blah, blah, blah. But now there's this whole thing where people are sharing cars and they're forming groups to share cars. And are they now car rental companies? Are they going to be regulated like car rental companies? Um, California actually just passed a new law about this. Um, so there, there's some movement to recognize these new ways that people are providing for each other. Uh, another example, carpooling. It's kind of, it's, a, it's as old as Dagwood. Um, and very, it's very easy to do, but it's very different from having a taxi cab company. But now there's a whole movement of people sharing rides but getting compensation for it. And, um, and there's all these really awesome new technologies where if you have a smartphone and you input where it is you're going and somebody else needs to go that way, you know, your phone's going to tell you where to pull over and pick them up. And then they get in your car and then the GPS tracks the mileage and then credits into your account half the mileage cost that the other person rode. I mean, it's really amazing. But now is the driver a taxi driver? Are they, uh, is, yeah. Another gray area. Uh, so backyard gardening. Not too regulated, although lately I've, been, lately I've been finding out how regulated it is. Um, but it is much different in scale from having a farm and the kind of regulations that farmers deal with. But now there are so many people who are just like, whoa, I have a lot of zucchini. I'm going to sell some of this. And getting out there and selling vegetables and running into a lot, a lot of barriers, zoning barriers, business regulations, health and safety laws. Um, but you know, there's also sort of the more in between places, people are swapping their vegetables a lot, you know, swapping it for other things they need. And the city of Oakland recently said, you can't swap your vegetables because that makes you a vegetable business. And um, I don't know. There's just like, it's definitely a gray area. And they're sort of drawing the line too far, in my opinion. But um, so then, you know, houses, we often have them. Very different from running a hotel. But what about this sort of in-between activity of having people come and stay in your home and maybe even getting a little compensation for that? There's a website called Airbnb that allows people to do this. I think there's a lot of websites now uh, where people can come and stay in for short-term stays. It's kind of like the new hotel. It's like peer-to-peer -peer hotels, people have referred to it. Um, and 
it could be a way to really make a livelihood or really cut your housing costs at least. So uh, in, this, in the state of New York right now, the hotel industry is trying to shut this activity down and saying these people are hotels. So building a house, uh, very different from building an entire subdivision of like Mc, other McMansions. Uh, but you know, I have a lot of clients because I do a lot of real estate law who are buying these properties out in Shasta County or wherever and they're gonna put six yurts on it and then everything comes and grinds to a halt when the local um, you know, zoning says, sorry, uh, you've just created a subdivision and you need to you know, write to the Department of Real Estate, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, so our laws are just, you know, they're not ready to recognize the different impact this is having from the impact that the uh, McMansions are having. Then buying groceries, very easy. It's different than being the grocery store itself. But there are all these people who are kind of like in between, who are forming these buying clubs. And sometimes they take, you know, they might take the shape of a, you know, a large grocery co-op with a location. But a lot of times what it looks like is that people purchase a ton of food in bulk and then divvy it up and then just kind of share the wholesale cost. And it's a really, it's a great way, like if you think about wanting to localize the food system and support local farmers, this is a really great way to do it, is if, if this group of people made a commitment to a squash farm that we're gonna buy 500 pounds of squash when it's ready to harvest and then divvy it up. Well, are these people, like at what point do these people become a grocery store and become regulated like a grocery store? I mean, they're selling to themselves, but you know, it, it can grow to become something like a grocery store. So solar panels are, you know, it, it's kind of expensive to put them on your house, but nowhere near as expensive as building an entire public utility. Uh, but there's, you know, a lot of ways that we can create alternative energy through collaboration. You know, it makes a lot of sense to have a group of neighbors maybe sharing a wind turbine. I've heard of examples of this happening in Minnesota. But generally, if you do stuff like this in California, you're considered a public, public utility. And then there's like the ways that we transact with each other, casual swapping exchanges, just so you know, this is not a taxable transaction. Uh, but this one is, according to the IRS, you know, if you're, if you're transacting uh, with things that, are, that you normally do as a business, then the value you receive is taxable. But then there's all this stuff that happens in between. Like you can just imagine, um, you know, I didn't ask for those PBJs. I didn't bargain for them or contract for them, but here they are. Um, really not PBJs, but I've gotten a lot of artichokes in exchange for work that I've done or collard greens and sort of according to the IRS, that's taxable income, but, but it's kind of hard to know. Like what's a gift versus what's income? So then, um, so there's me on my Hawaiian vacation, you know, enjoying picking fruit from the trees. On the surface, it might look a little bit like what this person's doing, but it's totally different, and it's regulated very differently, and, uh, which is good because farm workers can be very exploited. But our laws have gone so far to protect them that you can't even go to an organic farm anymore and volunteer, and you know, so many people want to do this. I want to do this. I was just like, I want to go get my hands in the dirt and, and learn about farming. But it's very hard for farmers to do this. In fact, some farms in California, especially in Marin and Sonoma County, have been fined a lot of money for having quote unquote interns. So there's also, um, you know, here's somebody doing favors for someone else in the kitchen. That's legal. It's very different from being an employee in a restaurant. But you know, what if this is your friend's like new underground restaurant thing or just a community soup night where people are gonna be asking for a few bucks? Um, are the people who are helping you out in the kitchen, are they now your employees? Um, so, and then finally, coming back to some, some of what Jenny was talking about, there's a lot of regulation on people making investments, securities laws. And basically, they're there to prevent people from exploiting investors, from taking their money and throwing it out. But, you know, it's, we, we make donations all the time. That's, a very, that's legal. Um, here's something that is regulated, is investing your money in big corporations and that you might not even know. And you know, it's definitely good that, that we have these regulations to protect us, but what if you just want to invest $100 in your neighbor's coffee shop? You know, this is somebody you know, it's a very small investment, very low risk, it's illegal. Jenny's working on that, she's doing some incredible work to change that, but. And then, you know, here's somebody buying cat food. It's different, very different than like purchasing a ton of stock in a giant cat food company, let's say. But what if you sort of start your own cat food company? Here you know you get 30 
cat people together, and they start a cat food co-op, natu all natural, healthy, sustainable cat food. And they all put in a thousand dollars to you know purchase a ton of. I, don't, I really don't know what they do. That's that's the cat people, but um, <laughs> but anyway, so they start this this cat food co-op, and they put a thousand dollars in. Maybe they form a little co-op corporation. That could be a security, you know, investing that thousand dollars in the cat food company or the cat food co-op could be a security subject to a whole lot of regulation. But you know, we we think that people should be able to do this. Um, so let me just see where am I? Yeah. So I kind of, you know, just in terms of like if you're thinking, okay, well, what do we do now to create a more sharing economy locally? Um, so here's a little to-do list just to give you a few suggestions. So first of all, what we all need to be doing is creating the platforms uh, for a more sharing economy. And, and those platforms might be events, you know, just things that bring people together to share things or to swap things. You know, there's a lot of, uh, in the Bay Area, this is happening a lot, a lot of barter and swapping events. It's a lot around food. Um, there's going to be a share festival, sharing festival in Santa Rosa in July. Uh, just to encourage people to start thinking about sharing on a neighborhood level. And then creating centers and places where sharing is going to happen. Happen. So tool lending libraries, you know, we could actually just take our, our local library system and add a branch that's like a tool lending library. That's what Oakland and Berkeley have done. And community gardens, parking lots that are designated for sharing rides for like, sort of like a park and ride. Um, Co-working spaces, that, you know, basically shared workspaces. So building all of these things in our communities, and then building organizations and networks through which people are going to share, like childcare cooperatives, or um, you know, the time banks, or local currencies, local investing groups. So that's one thing to do. Next on the to-do list is build the technology. That's actually kind of intimidating. I should just say, well, there's a lot of people out there who are building the technology. Um, and, but there's, you know, there's a lot of ways to get creative. I think technology is going to enable us to um, share in ways that we never could have imagined. It's kind of like, you know, a lot of times people listen to this whole sharing, barter, blah, 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 and they're like, oh, that's such an old idea. But, you know, now we're going to be able to take it to new levels because of the technology that, uh, that enables us to communicate and connect with each other and keep track of information. And so these are just some examples of dot coms, websites that help, help people share. A few that I'm really excited about up in the corner, R Block, Go Go Verde, Oh So We. These are like um, little social networks for neighborhoods, and they're all kind of in beta. Actually, the one that you can start using now is OhSoWe.com. Basically, you create a network with your neighbors where if you're on Facebook, you know you get status updates all day about who knows what, everything. But what, the, what these are going to be are status updates about your neighbors, like, um, has anybody seen my cat? Or, hey, I'm going to have a ton of extra zucchini. Does anybody want some? Or, um, hey, so and so's trying to get rid of zucchini. Lock your doors. Or, um, <laughs> so it's just a way for neighbors to like, know each other, keep up to date with each other, and share stuff. So it's going to be a great platform for, for getting us sharing in our local communities. But, um, so third on the to-do list, encourage a culture of sharing, because we just don't have one. I mean, if you do go and knock on your neighbor's door and say, I have this whole idea about how we're going to build a sharing neighborhood, it's just, you know, they're going to be like, who are you? And, uh, you know, this is just this really foreign idea. I think a lot of people are, yeah, we're just, it's, it's just kind of a hard thing to jump into. But like I say, there are little ways that we can start to create fertile ground. And, and um I forget how often I use the zucchini example, but um, anyways, yeah, to just start to create like an expectation in a neighborhood, like let's do more for each other, let's start to provide for each other, not just in a neighborhood, um, you know, among friends, among uh, other businesses. So creating that culture of sharing, I think we can all just start to plant the, the seeds. And then uh, become part of the critical mass. And what I mean is that there's a lot of new projects that are just sprouting up. And I heard there is a time bank locally. Um, Yay, wherever. Yeah. Anyway, so you know, a time bank, a time bank is a really great way. I mean, we have a, a lot of we have a scarcity of money in our communities. Uh, you know, we can't always use money to get things that we need, but we can do favors for each other as much as we want. There is no limit to the number of favors we can do for each other, and we can keep track of them through a time bank. And people can sort of accumulate points for the favors they do for each other and redeem them. And uh, but if there's only two members of the time bank, it's not going to work. 
So becoming part of the critical mass, just like get involved and, and start using it because that once there is a critical mass, that could really uh, start to become a whole new part of our uh, economic system. And oh yeah, and there's a couple, you know, those those websites too, the ones where you create a, a neighborhood network. Um, what else about it? critical mass? Well, yeah. So. And then working on our, our sharing skills. I mean, honestly, for me, I would say I'm kind of like on that line between introvert, extrovert. Sharing kind of scares me, like the idea of like having to cooperate with people and talk with them all the time and be around them all the time. I have a friend who was in this great carpool arrangement. He had to commute 40 miles a day to get to, um, actually he had to commute 80, to get from Sonoma to Berkeley. And so he was saving thousands of dollars per year through his carpool. But he got so tired of people talking, 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 all the way there and all the way back. But he just quit. But, but you know, one kind of sharing skill that we could develop to just make this whole thing easier on ourselves is just knowing our limits. Because we don't actually have to push our limits. We just have to really find ways to communicate them in ways that, um, well, specifically, the ways that are going to be easy for other people to hear. Like, you know what? I actually, I really like to use my commute time to sort of space out. And uh, maybe we could just sort of like talk in the evenings and not the mornings or something like that. Like, there are, there are ways to bring things up. And the, I think a lot of people, especially if you were involved in co-op movements back in the 60s or 70s, and you saw it all blow apart in massive conflict, like, yeah, the conflict stuff is scary. But I do think there's just, like, it's really just a matter of, of developing our skills of communication, flexibility, cooperation. And, um, and when, I, when I've started to work on these myself, like, the whole sharing thing became much less scary. So, and then finally, designing laws and policies and the legal structures to create more sharing worlds. And this is what Jenny and I do all day long, because as complicated as all of these little gray areas are, it's really the world that we want to live in. So basically, you want to come back up and talk more about what we do. Basically, what we're doing is mapping out the legal landscape. Uh, for one, she's going to talk a little bit about our various programs. So um, Janelle and I, are, we both have private practices and we're lucky enough to work with clients that are doing a lot of this kind of thing, but you know, we're both very aware that a lot of people can't afford lawyers and also you know, there are very few lawyers doing this, so we need a lot more information out there than what just Janelle and I can do through our private practice. So we started Sustainable Economies Law Center as a way to provide a lot more information about people who, for people who need to know the legal constraints on these kinds of activities. Unfortunately, we've seen so many people doing these amazing things, like having you know, internships on their farms and, or raising money for a wonderful local business, and then it turns out they're not doing it legally, they're not doing it correctly under the law, and they can get into lots of trouble. So we, we wish we didn't have to be the bearers of bad news a lot of the time, but unfortunately it is the reality. So we, we want to educate people about what the laws are, but we also are working to change the laws and also to help people navigate the laws because some of it can seem very intimidating. Oh, you know, legally you're required to do this, this, and this, and oh, it's really hard. But we can, we're starting to be able to help people navigate some of those things and actually comply with the laws. And we're hoping that as we do these things more and more, we'll have templates and tools that people can use to be able to do these activities and not get into legal trouble. So SELC has five program areas uh, that, and we there's really even more than this, but <laughs> These are our basic program areas. One is urban agriculture, so we just work on all the issues that come up when people are growing food in their yard and maybe wanting to sell it or barter it. Um, one thing we're working on right now is um, in Berkeley, they're looking at creating a new law that would allow people to sell the food that they grow in their backyard, so we have an intern working on that. We, work, we get a lot of work done in the summer because that's when we have a lot more interns. We have law student interns and non-law student interns. And that's really great because what we, you know, some people think, oh, if I'm not a lawyer or at least if I don't have a law degree, this stuff is just so confusing, I'll never get it. But it's really not true. I mean, anyone can get it. We have non-law student interns that are totally getting it. They're writing 
these ordinances, you know, they're figuring it out, they're explaining it to lay people. In some ways it's better because they can understand a lay person's perspective on it, but if they figure it out, they can explain it to people. So, um, so we really are trying to make it as accessible as possible to as many people as possible. Um, so that's the urban agriculture program. We also do workshops for people that are involved in urban agriculture to explain some of the legal issues they need to think about. Um, the Community Supported Entrepreneurship Program, that's kind of a fancy name for the securities law program. <laughs> so this is um, the securities laws. A lot of people don't even know about them, but there is a major, major limit on our ability to invest in the things we might want to invest in. So I don't know, how many people have heard of the securities laws? Okay, a few. So, um, so just the basic rule is that every time you solicit any kind of an investment, whether it's a loan, whether you're selling stock, whether you're just making some kind of a deal with someone where you say, if you give me $1,000 now, I'll give you $1,100 in a year, you know? All those things are governed by state and federal securities laws, and they're very restrictive. The laws were passed in the 30s to protect investors, which is a good thing, but it's gotten to the point where it is so incredibly onerous that only if you're very, a very wealthy, big business can you actually afford to, bring it, to do all the legal and accounting and all of that work to actually be able to solicit investors. And if you meet that definition of an accredited investor, you have a lot more options in what you can invest in because there's an assumption that if you're that wealthy that you'll be a smarter investor, which obviously is not a very good assumption. There's lots of people who you know, can do a lot of research, especially when you're talking about a local business where you may know all about you know, the people that are starting the business. You might know about the community and whether the business is likely to be successful. But if you're not one of those wealthy people, which is about 2% of the population, you're not allowed to invest in local businesses. The only place we're allowed to invest our money is in you know, mutual funds, banks, that sort of thing. So, and, and it's silly because, I mean, obviously people need to be protected from fraudulent investment schemes or for risk, from risky investment schemes, but if you think about all the other things that we're allowed to do without all this protection, like going into a casino and losing our life savings in a casino without having to read any kind of a 100-page prospectus with a million different, you know, small print warnings on it. It is kind of silly that we're not allowed to invest in our local communities. So, uh, so this is something we've been working on. I, I, we have a, one of our advisory board members is Michael Schumann, and he's a really great thought leader in this area. He actually has a book coming out early next year on a lot of these investment issues and how to invest in your local community. And uh, he has two other books, The Small Mart Revolution and Going Local, that talk a lot about this. And in one of his books, he says, he just kind of makes this off-the-cuff comment, why couldn't we just invest $100 of our, of, of our money in whatever we wanted to? Why does the federal and state security regulators have to get in our way if it's just $100? I mean, most people don't even know that it is illegal for you to invest $100 in a small local business. So we took that little off-the-cuff comment in his book, and we decided last summer when we had some really great law student interns to write a letter to the federal securities regulators to request an exemption for $100 investments. So it didn't go very far for a while. We didn't hear anything. We submitted it last July. But all of a sudden, it's actually starting to get some traction. It's uh, the head of the Securities and Exchange Commission actually mentioned our petition in a letter she wrote. And it's been discussed in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and all over the place. And it, more and more people are starting to talk about, you know, there, there have been congressional hearings. You know, why is it that we're not allowed to invest a small amount in whatever we want to? Do we really need to be protected that much? So we're going to continue to work on that and, and look at um, doing something similar at the state level, some of this, you know, looking at some of the states and seeing if we can change some of the laws at the state level as well. So we also have a cooperatives program. Uh, that's, cooperatives are a very underused uh, type of business. And part of the reason is people just don't know much about them. If you're in California and you want to form a cooperative, 
you know, when you start a business, one of the first things you do is you go onto the California government secretary of state website to say, oh, you know, how do I form a new business? And they have all kinds of instructions on how to form a corporation, a limited liability company, a nonprofit, nothing about how to form a co-op. And I had a client that actually formed the wrong type of entity because it's just completely unclear. And that's a big problem. So we're trying to create a lot more awareness uh, among people all over the country on the benefits of co-ops and how to form them. And in California, we happen to have a very poorly written uh, co-op statute. So we're, we actually have a group of people that are working on amending the statute to make it more friendly, especially for worker cooperatives. Um, in our barter and local currency program, um, we are helping community groups that are trying to create various forms of alternative currency. So, you know, as Janelle talked about, you know, if you, you may not even need dollars, dollars are sort of this fiction that we're all taught to believe is so important, but really if you can get what you need in some other ways, you don't really need the dollar. So uh, if you can create currency or you know, time banks or other sort of things like that, you can actually facilitate getting a lot of the things you need without having to have dollars. So we have, um, we have a client in Davis, California, that we're helping to create a time, uh, local currency. There's one in Oakland that we're hoping to help out. And then the Rethinking Home program has been looking at ways that homes can be more shared, less subject to the profit motive. And let's see, what else can I say about that? We haven't been doing a lot in that program lately, but it's also a really exciting area that Janelle knows a lot more about than I do. Um, let's see. So do you want to... So just to give you an idea of what we're working on this summer, so we have a group of interns, um, and we're focusing a lot on food, because a lot of people like food. And if, if you think about it, food is a really great place to start if you want to change the economies, because if, you're, if you eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and other food every single day, like those are many different opportunities in which to use your consumer dollars in a new way or a more sustainable way. And um, so we've identified these eight core legal questions around food. And, and these, a lot of these questions are ones that would apply to many other industries. But uh, as Jenny mentioned, there's a lot going on around home-based and informal food enterprises. And one thing uh, one of our interns is working on is uh, cottage food laws. So in about half the US states, there are laws that say that if you make uh, bread, baked goods, granola, jam, in your home, you can sell them. And these are really low-risk food items. Almost no one ever gets poisoned by them. So uh, it makes sense that we could sort of open up a whole new realm of mi micro-enterprise by allowing people to do this in their home. So she's looking into that. We've, she's ready, we're ready to submit a letter to a legislature and see if we can get this through in California in 2012. And uh, there's also a lot of other laws that have been sort of considered around the country recently related to sort of small-scale food production. There's, uh, let's see, there's right to grow laws which prevent local zoning and homeowners associations or landlords from telling you you can't grow vegetables in your yard. Uh, there are uh, things called food sovereignty laws which really haven't passed yet but they've been proposed in a handful of places. There's a town in Maine that's adopted one but usually they really have to happen at the statewide level. Uh, but they say that unprocessed, any unprocessed food items that you produce uh, by yourself at your home could be sold. And so they tend to include things like raw milk, and of course everyone freaks out about that. So, um, but we're, you know, we're just sort of like exploring these possibilities or like what, what could be possible or what could get passed. Another thing is uh, in Wyoming, they just passed a thing called the traditional food law. Um, it's a little bit vague, but basically what it says is that if you cook food in your home, you can sell it if you do so through a traditional food event like a a wedding or a funeral or a charity fundraiser or a church dinner um, and you know people do this anyways and but there are you know there have been like cases where certain bake sales have been shut down and uh, you know technically like if you're selling this stuff you you really should have all of, like a certified commercial kitchen and and uh, have all of the health permits so, so that's one example we look a lot at the labor issue because um, a lot of the ways that people want to 
create their food, grow their food, prepare it, provide food for each other, might make them um, employees of, of someone or themselves. So for example, like if you had a group of people who form a food co-op, and I mean, this is very common for food co-ops, is they ask the members, who are also the owners, to come in and volunteer like two or three hours a month. And a lot of co-ops have been called out on this to say that like, you're violating labor laws, you should be paying all of these volunteers minimum wage. And there is a co-op in New York that's been doing this, you know, Park Slope Food Co-op has been doing this forever without really getting busted for it. So we're trying to, you know, just look at like, are there variations in state labor laws? You know, why can some people do this and others can't? Um, you know, Jenny talked a lot about community supported enterprises. Of course, there's a whole community supported agriculture model where people pay farmers up front for a share of the harvest. It's a really great thing because you know a lot of the cost of farming happens up front, but the profit from it comes later. Um, but this model is being applied in many other aspects or areas of the food industry. Uh, how can people form food co-ops? Um, well, what are what can be the role of nonprofits in food production? So. Uh, you know, nonprofit organizations, and I should say organizations that are tax exempt under 501c3, are kind of limited in their ability to act like a normal business. And, but, you know, food is something that we do, uh, sometimes we do it for educational purposes or charitable purposes, but when we do have a lot of it, you know, it's like, why not sell it? Why not try to start making an income stream? But at some point when you start to look too much like a commercial business, the IRS sort of cuts you off and says, sorry, that's, that's not related enough to your tax exempt purposes. So we're trying to just sort of figure out how far can we go with that. Um, again, uh, you know, looking at people growing food at a on a commercial basis in urban, urban areas, because you can grow food for your personal consumption without a whole lot of limitations, but when you start to sell it, that sort of triggers all of the zoning laws and all the laws that apply to commercial businesses. Uh, getting access to land, we've been helping a, um, a land trust form around this organization or for this organization called Food Commons, which is hoping to uh, put a lot of land into food in, into a land trust for the benefit of the food system. So it could be farmland, it could be land uh, that's used for um, for a restaurant or a food store. And we're just looking a lot at the you know governance models for how how can we make sure this this land really is used for the benefit of the community and not just leased to Safeway or something like that. And then food currencies, this this is just such a great idea. Like the more I think about it. Uh, is it, there's, there are a couple models that have been sort of floated around. One is this idea like that people who go and sort of volunteer or put their time in to a food business could be paid in something like a food credit, or it could be you know it could be a little certificate like that that then they could take elsewhere and redeem for food. But this totally violates labor laws. It's really complicated. But what um, and basically it violates labor laws because people do need to be paid minimum wage in dollars according to the law. But um, another way that this could be used is for the food producers and suppliers to create a currency among themselves. And so, um, and there might be dollars involved. Like an example is, you know, one person invests in a chicken farm. Maybe they invest, like, say, $10,000. And that chicken farm makes an agreement to supply the chickens to a local grocery store, you know, a small grocery store. And the person who gave that upfront capital um, gets like uh, chicken credits, chicken money, that they can then go redeem for food at that grocery store. So it kind of has to be a, th a multiple, like a three-way transaction, because the person who put the $10,000 in is not gonna want that much chicken, but they're gonna want a lot of other things. And so there, you know, there are all these entities that aggregate food and prepare food and get it into a form that we want it, but we, you know, we can keep dollars out of a lot of these transactions uh, by using a food currency. So those are some of the things we're working on. And you know, as for these legal hoops, a lot of what we do is we just we try to teach people how to leverage resources, kind of build economies of scale through cooperatives or community-owned businesses. So actually like taking the resources in our communities and if we have to get through those really high legal hoops, you know, finding ways to do that. And then um, let me see, I'm just trying to think, did I forget to talk about anything? But yeah, pretty much. Uh, when we do feel like these legal hoops are way too high, uh, we're trying to bring them back down to earth by, by through legislation, trying to change local laws, state laws, federal laws, uh, because we want to be able to use these laws for building a way cooler economy, and, uh, and that's what it's going to look like. 
And I guess, I guess the last thing I want to say is just to encourage everybody to get involved locally. In, well, just in, in building a, a more sustainable economy, a more sharing economy, but also there's a lot you could do to bring these legal hoops back down to earth locally. And a lot of the cities that have started to consider like urban garden related legislations, like well, Oakland, Berkeley, San Francisco, they've all been pretty friendly to it. It's just a matter of a group of people calling it to the attention and really trying to push it through. I mean, I'm not going to say that it's all going to be easy, but, um, but yeah, definitely get involved locally because there's so much work to be done. And I also want to say for those of you who are trying to figure out what your career is going to be or your next career, there are pretty much in every city and town in the US except for Oakland, there's a need for sharing lawyers. So. <laughs> Or not, not sharing lawyers, but um, you know, just pe not necessarily sharing lawyers, but people who are really thinking about the logistics, the legal structures of how to create a more sharing economy. So, um, so become an expert in this stuff and, and start to be that person at the local community who, who understands what a co-op is and how it works and how to get one started. And, um, and I guess another thing that you can do just to sort of help us in our work is tell people about what we're doing, because we do have a tendency to like, be lost in statutes all day and working on projects, and we have, we're not so good at the PR stuff. But it, you know, that's what people like you are for. Like, if you're enthusiastic about what we do, you know, please tell people, send people to our website. I should have put it up here, but it's theselk.org. It's S E L C. It's the selk. Sorry about that. Dot org, and uh, and watch our cartoon on there. It has a little bit of overlap from what you've just seen today. And you know, try to get that one to go viral on the internet. Um, and then, you know, definitely we can use all the funding we could we could get. So if you think of, if you know of funders or people who want to make contributions, that would be very helpful to us. And um, and yeah, I just want to say go for it. You know, I think the most important thing that I think about all the time, I think about all the aspects of sustainability, ecological sustainability, economic sustainability. But like when it gets down to it, I think the only thing that's going to be sustainable is is when we're having fun and really enjoying it. And I used to think, you know, oh, we have to save the world. We just, we just have to do it. It's going to be a lot of work. We're going to have to make a lot of sacrifices. And, um, and I realized it's not going to be like that. It's actually going to be way more fun and way more interesting than the world that we have right now. So I'd say, yeah, let's just go for it. And thanks for listening.